Welcome to this webinar about how to simply deploy cybersecure Converge plant-wide Ethernet. Ethernet is used in a wide range of industrial automation applications, including discrete manufacturing, utilities, food and beverage, pharmaceutical, chemical, oil and gas, and a wide range of other applications. I'm Bill Lydon, editor of Automation.com. The convergence of plant-wide Ethernet with information systems is a growing trend, but it can be challenging, particularly with the various industrial Ethernet work protocols that exist today and many requiring fixed IP addressing, which creates some interesting issues. All of this must be accomplished with cybersecurity protection to be sure production runs without interruption. So today, it's my pleasure to have Tempered Networks industry expert Eric Giza and Rob Goss to inform and educate us about these topics. I just I discovered Tempered Networks at an industry show and was very impressed after reviewing their offering and asked them some pretty difficult questions, particularly based on my experience as an engineer dealing with problems in the field that they can have found ways to solve very simply. Now Rob Gross, one of our presenters, has over 25 years of networking and security experience across a broad range of technologies and environments. He lives and works in the manufacturing hub of North America around Michigan. Rob has helped many large enterprises and manufacturing organizations solve complex networking and application delivery challenges while reducing costs, enhancing security, and improving efficiencies. Um, Eric is responsible for product strategy and go-to-market execution. Prior to Tempered, he served as Senior Vice President of Marketing and Business Development at ExtraHop Networks, where he helped grow revenue 15 times and helped take ExtraHop from startup to market leader in IT operations and analytics. One thing I like about having spent a lot of time with both of these people is the very practical answers and understanding of what these issues are. Now today, the this webinar is being recorded, and it'll be later to attendees for review, so you don't have to take copious notes. During the webinar, you can submit questions by typing them in the chat window, which should be on the right side of your screen. Now, we'll address questions at the end of the presentation, but in the event we run out of time to answer all questions submitted, you'll receive answers later from the company experts. So Eric, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I'm certainly interested in learning more, and please proceed. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and I appreciate all the attendees that took uh, valuable time out of your day to listen to this. So we, we hope we and have every intention to make this worth, worth your while. Um, all of you are facing some pretty significant uh, challenges, dilemmas, but also opportunities. And there is going to be a pretty major fork in the road uh, coming pretty soon when uh, people are really looking at how to bring together IT and OT technologies, the convergence, and enabling converged plant-wide Ethernet. And this whole talk is uh, we're we're going to be you know having today is around how do you do this in the most cost-effective, efficient, secure, and simple manner possible. So uh, first and foremost, we're going to be talking about some new concepts here today that you might be unfamiliar with, but we fundamentally believe uh, is going to be the future of Internet technologies. And it's this notion of an identity-first model when it comes to networking. Um, this is what drives the unification of security and networking, but it also drives tremendous simplicity and eliminates a lot of the unnecessary complexity that you typically find with traditional networking and security products. And we'll get into and in explaining how that works. We'll also talk about some real world use cases and, and, and the outcomes uh, that we've experienced with our customers. And then uh, Rob is going to get on and speak to not only the variety of use cases, but we're going to give you a quick demo because there's nothing more powerful than uh, putting the, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding, if you will. Uh, and hopefully this too will spur a lot of good questions and of course if we can't get to all of them, we will 
uh, end up recording and, um, uh, and, and sending out an email of those questions to anybody who's registered. So uh, moving forward, one of the interesting aspects, and in the technology world, our birth was a bit unusual. Uh, tempered networks, the technology was originally developed in relationship to Boeing. So we were born in the operational technology and manufacturing world along with the uh, U.S. military for secure field communications. Uh, in Boeing's challenge uh, back in, in two, the, the mid-2000s, they had a significant problem of a backlog for their 777s. And, and Tempered Networks is based in Seattle. Washington and of course Boeing's uh, 777 program is north of Seattle and Everett. They had the capacity to produce about 34 planes a month but their backlog required ramping that up to 54 planes a month. The problem they had is that their uh, network on the manufacturing floor here was uh, air gapped and uh, the tooling was fixed. And that was the big bottleneck for creating or, or preventing uh, increased capacity of manufacturing efficiency. So they, they, they have the notion that, well, if we can make our tooling mobile, um, we can accelerate the development and manufacturing of planes, uh, meet our targets. But this would require uh, getting on the Wi-Fi network, uh, sharing the corporate network, um, and of course that opens up a whole host of security issues, especially for an organization like Boeing that is uh, a, a massive target for uh, corporate espionage, uh, among other things. So we worked with Boeing on a new, leveraging a new protocol called the Host Identity Protocol to develop a solution that would, in essence, give the Wi-Fi network um, as good, if not better, security than an air gap network with micro segmentation, given the flexibility to easily orchestrate access and communication, secure communication between all machines and even micro segmented access out to specific vendors on an on demand basis, what we call vendor net. Hence, Tempered was born. The outcome, and we've made this now commercially available. Tempered Networks is not a subsidiary. We, we own the technology outright, and we've been uh, making it commercially available since late 2012. Uh, the fundamental problem we're solving, and this is what I meant earlier about the fork in the road that all of you on the phone listening to this webinar will be facing. Um, traditional IP networking and security is broken. There's a fundamental flaw. Uh, that is the primary cause of issues that we see with hacks today. The ease of use within uh, penetrating networks and the lateral movement within the networks. And it's the function that an IP address serves as identity in traditional networking and security models. With our approach, an identity first model, we're able to unify networking and security, which drives the simplicity and lower CapEx and OpEx. But the outcomes that our customers achieve is, in essence, creating a unified and cloaked fabric that is easy to orchestrate, provides global mobility, which overcomes the IP conflict issues uh, and the IP mobility issues that a lot of organizations experience when they're trying to bring um, these manufacturing industrial control systems and PLCs and such online. And again, we'll talk about this when we get into the use cases and demos specifically. And then also the ability to provide things, services like, you know, segmentation. And I mean hardened segmentation. Uh, and we'll get into examples of that. But the whole point here is a new model that drives simplicity and better security that's never been done before, and it's based on identity. Now, another key element, too, is the ability, you don't want a different architecture 
Um, if you have a remote site and a different security architecture and on the plant and at the data center and if you're also leveraging any cloud services, our customers have expressly said they want a unified fabric that can span the boundaries and, and create that, that, that encrypted and highly resilient network that is nearly impenetrable. And so we have a lot of different solutions and platforms that can go nearly anywhere, use any connectivity medium, uh, nearly any connectivity medium in any environment so that you're not restricted in how far and wide uh, the technology can be deployed. And again, the fundamental element here is it must be simple, fast, and predictable to orchestrate. You shouldn't have to have a PhD. And so what our customers experience, typically experience when they're able to overcome the IP conflicts, a lot of the security policy controls that have consistently failed IT in the past, it are things like this, a 97% reduction or acceleration in time to provisioning. To be able to instantly give a remote vendor or engineer direct access to a singular device on the plant for not just the network, but the actual device itself, and to be able to instantly revoke that or do it on a time-based basis makes this very cost-effective and, and, and simple. And we'll show you this too when we get to the demo. Now, this is what I meant by the fork in the road. On the left, or the traditional technologies. And one of the things that, that, that I've realized, and I've been um, you know, managing products for over 25 years now, uh, first at F5 Networks, and uh, recently at uh, ExtraHop, and now at Tempered. And one of the things that's interesting is when there's a major initiative like Converge Plant-Wide Ethernet, Vendors jump on that bandwagon and they say, hey, we need that, there, there's an initiative there, there's an opportunity, um, let's reposition our products for that initiative. Well, these are products that are proven and, you know, have grown up in the enterprise network, but you've got to ask yourself, is this really the model you want to apply to an opportunity where you're, where you're going to be modernizing um, the, the factory floor manufacturing itself. Um, because traditional, if you ask any of your IT colleagues, um, traditional networking is complex, it's costly, and it's incredibly fragile. And despite all the money that we have spent on securing IT networks, we still get hacked. Um, we still have to, we, we have an uh, IT uh, uh, employment issue, skills gap. We can't hire enough people to manage this. It's too complex. So the question that you're going to be facing, do you really want to carry forward that model to the manufacturing environment to accomplish the objectives of converged plant-wide Ethernet? Because this is what you will be inheriting to set security, and networking controls. Um, managing an environment based on uh, access control lists, VPNs, uh, next generation firewalls or legacy firewalls, and you know routing and, 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 and layer two policies, all these things have to be touched and managed just to get things networked and also in an attempt to try and provide some type of segmentation. And then you've got the question about what about encryption end to end? Because the VPN doesn't do that. Um, and so it brings up a whole bunch of issues. And the question for you will be, do we want to mimic the legacy model or do we want to leapfrog? And our customers are happy because they're leapfrogging and they're avoiding this fundamental issue. You know how I said there's a fundamental flaw in TCP IP? And that flaw is that we use an IP address 
for a dual purpose. We use it as both identity of the thing and location. IP was never meant to serve as identity. It was purely meant to be served as location. Where is this thing? So uh, a device or a network element could find that thing and communicate with it. Yet whole industries have grown up using the IP address as identity. Um, that's how we set policies today in layer two and layer three networking gear. That's how we set policy in firewalls is based on an IP address. But we know IP addresses are ephemeral. They change, or they need to be static, and then you get conflicts. And then, because of those conflicts, you have to re-IP everything, and that adds more cost and complexity. And then, once you do get these things deployed, think about every touch point that has to be made now when you've got an event like vendor access, or you want to implement you know, micro failover for a particular group of PLCs to a redundant historian. How are you going to do that? Are you going to use uh, you know, routing and routing convergence through that. That's costly, that's expensive, it's fragile. Are you going to use DNS? Well, what if they, they doesn't use host names? Um, and then what about access control and segmentation and encryption? And every time you want to do something, think about the complexity of modifying the environment and doing these updates and then trying to keep everything in sync. Um, this is what leads to so many uh, vulnerabilities, unintentional vulnerabilities, because uh, it is very difficult when you're talking about networking not only just servers and PCs, but now you're networking machines that are mobile, some are static, some could be remote, and you've got to give access to different vendors at different time or different engineers, uh, depending upon what it is. Um, this gets in the way of making a hardened, resilient, and very easy to manage environment. So what does this look like? Um, in essence, the way we have been managing connected things, and I'm including IT here as well, not just the operational technologies, is what in essence is an address-defined network. We use the IP address all the way up. Uh, the stack uh, as not only location but identity. The way forward is native host identity, provable cryptographic identity of the thing so that the IP address now serves and can go back to serving its original purpose as just being location. This is where what Boeing and the military worked on back in the early 2000s, which we, um, in this decade, have recently commercialized and made available to everybody. This abstraction, and it's seamless, it's backward and forward compatible, that's the beauty. This is an open standard. Um, the ability to drive unique cryptographic identity that's easy to orchestrate down to the individual device level that also includes automatic encryption, military-grade encryption, and the ability to instantly connect, segment, revoke, failover, whatever, is now in the hands of an administrator. And you don't have to have a PhD to operate this, as you'll see when, uh, when we get to the demo. So how does this work? It's, it's, it's beautiful in its simplicity. You set what we call a HIP service, a host identity protocol service, in front of the things you want to network and protect. And when, and, and there has to, it's always symmetrical, so you know, it, uh, one HIP service has to talk to another HIP service. In this diagram, all you're seeing are HIP switches. These would be physical uh, gateways, if you will, that sit in front of PLCs and say uh, a, a historian. And the conductor is the orchestration engine. And it is able to easily set trust-based policies to say PLC1 can talk to historian and nothing else. 
And guess what? That is a micro segment of one and it cannot be traversed, it cannot be violated, and all communication between the hip service endpoints is encrypted. What's so powerful about this, and this is the beauty of the host identity protocol, every device behind a hip service is cloaked. It cannot be discovered by a hacker. That's because of this principle. TCP transport in data exchange is not established or set up until the host is authenticated and authorized with its unique cryptographic IDs that have been set, the policy has been set by the orchestration engine. So I could ping, I could, even if I knew the IP address of the historian or the PLC and I entered your network. And if that thing was behind a hip service and I was trying to ping it or end map it, it wouldn't respond because I'm not, I don't have the correct cryptographic identity um, to be able to communicate with that guy. So the hip service would just drop it. It doesn't respond. Um, there's nothing like this in the market. Uh, and this is what not only drives a much hardened, more hardened security model, but also dramatically simplifies the overall environment. So let's use a case study to bring this home. We have one customer, again, you know, the initiative, converge plant-wide Ethernet, and they were faced with a number of issues. You know, they had these islands of communication um, between different PLC groups, different manufacturing lines, uh, various control services, and even their compliance and their auditing systems. And then they also had these different uh, connectivity issues, like um, can we use cellular? Should we use cellular? Should we leverage an MPLS network? Or should we go with a dedicated lease line? Or uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all those incur costs. And they also incur complexity. Um, and so they wanted you know, a common model. Could could does the connectivity medium have to matter? Um, because I might need to set different security policies and use different technologies if I'm leveraging cellular as opposed to an MPLS network, for example. And then what about encryption? Um, how do I get it as far and deep and wide as possible, as cost effectively as possible, without having to manage certificates? Oh, that's a, that's a problem space in and of itself. And then, you know, the security policies and the ease of use, like what, what, how, how do I quickly give highly segmented access to a remote vendor to a specific um, a control system, for example, instead of the whole network? Because if I give them access to the whole network, that's a, that, that could be a security um, uh, vector, attack vector. And then, of course, there's the classic biggest issue. I... We have so many customers that have used the same IP addressing scheme in uh, different plants. And how do I bring these together? I'm going to have to re-IP everything? Well, you don't necessarily need to. Enter tempered networks. The solution is the identity defined network, where it's an identity first model. Um, and where our HIP services um, act as the proxy or um, we do have software and embedded capabilities, so we can go actually down and embed on the device itself. Um, but if you can't do that, uh, we're able to, you know, use our gateways that sit in front of these things. And we have platforms that are cellular capable, are Ethernet capable, um, are it supports serial over IP, et cetera. Um, and we, first and foremost, cloak, segment, and are able to ride on top of, this is an overlay technology, it's non-disruptive, it doesn't require modifying the existing underlay network of routers and switches. What it does is it obviates the need of a lot of the complexity that people embed or configure in those systems. 
we have customers that no longer need to use the routing access control list, which is really a form of poor man's segmentation, um, because it's based on IP addresses and, and, and ports. Um, instead, they're using us for segmentation. So it greatly simplifies that environment. And by deploying at each of their locations, one of our HIP services or gateways, they're able to create this unified encrypted fabric and setting policy of specifying exactly what device can talk to which other device. And only that or only those groups. It becomes explicit and it becomes uh, entirely based on unique crypto identity instead of IP addresses. IP addresses don't go away, but they get put in their place. They're used for um, locating that thing on that local area network that's sitting behind the HIP service. And so what they end up getting because of the cloaking, the segmentation, um, the always-on automatic encryption without the certificate overhead and, and such um, is 100% of their cloaked resources where um, a HIP service is deployed. So these things could not be discoverable either by, through the internet or um, if somebody were able to penetrate the network itself. And the beautiful thing here too, it's elastic. Remember that second or third slide I showed you where our principle is to be able to be deployed, get identity everywhere in the cloud, on laptops if you want, on servers, in front of things that can't protect themselves, remote locations out you know, on a skid on some pipeline somewhere, it doesn't matter. We want to get identity everywhere. Only then will we be able to create a truly secure, trusted internet and one that enables IP mobility without the conflicts. And so being able to future-proof yourself to say, you know what, we've got some historians we want to run in the cloud, either for backup, but we also want those protected. Great. It, it can extend at that far. Or we have remote technicians now. Now I can give access on demand to those technicians without having to touch my firewalls and VPNs and access control lists. I do it one spot, trust or revoke or uh, disable the communication. Um, and again, we'll show you this quickly when we get to the demo here. And so the outcomes our customers experience are pretty profound. Um, in fact, a lot of our customers say that once they deploy Tempered, they're able to realize a return on investment in the reduced costs and complexity and the, the, the speed with which they can bring services online in a secure and, and hardened fashion. Um, underwrites a purchase itself. And again, my intent here isn't to sell you on tempered. My ultimate intent is to sell you on the idea that you should lead with identity first. That is the way forward. And um, in the OT world, we're sitting on a great opportunity to revolutionize the way we network things because um, in the OT world, we're not saddled with all the legacy baggage that a lot of our IT counterparts are, are currently saddled with. And so with that, we end up with a highly segmented, controlled environment that's easy to manage. Um, you're able to instantly connect, cloak, segment, even fail over these resources, quarantine them um, if something bad is detected. Uh, and so now with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob to talk about some of the, the, the use cases that, that we encounter in the manufacturing world based on his expertise, and then he's going he's gonna to give us a demo. Rob? Thanks, Eric. So we're going to talk specifically about some of the use cases that we're seeing in the manufacturing side. And, and a lot of these use cases are, are use cases that have been brought to our attention, ones that we've discovered. And surprisingly, these are use cases that are really across the board. It didn't make a difference if it was a, you know, a raw materials manufacturer or a consumer goods manufacturer or an auto manufacturer as such. So one of the biggest things that a lot of people are trying to do, especially now with 
the concept of converge plant ethernet is how do you get things to one be able to communicate together or you know to be able to use that intelligence from individual devices to help your business secondly is with that and now that we are putting IP addresses on pretty much everything and trying to pull all this communication, how do we actually give the, originally there were islands. Well, how are we be able to merge or bridge those individual islands that you have, both within a plant as well as within specific networks within that individual plant? So that's another thing that's also important. One of the other big issues that, it, that organizations are trying to address is that you know, way back when and even up until a couple of years ago, you know, the concept of somebody actually going in and trying to attack a specific machine or, or attack a PLC or, or something else like this really didn't exist. Now with, with everything pretty much being exposed to an IP addressing scheme, now we're having to worry about how do we restrict or cloak those individual resources that are physically within the environment? So a lot of a lot of specific customers are having those issues as well. Um, one other thing that's very important, and, and Eric kind of alluded to that as well, is vendor net. You know, looking at a lot of these things, there's a, there's a lot of different use cases that a lot of people are trying to address. But really, at the end of the day, how do we put all this together? And I'm going to show my screen now, and let me explain kind of what we're what we're seeing here. This is that orchestration engine that Eric was describing. We call it the conductor. And let me kind of explain how we got to the point where I'm at today within this. The conductor itself is truly that. Um, this is a single pane of glass that allows you to manage individual environments or devices right from this location. One of the things that's very important to note is these HIP services that we have, there's only really a couple things that you can do to them. First and foremost is put them on the wire. So give them a specific IP address to actually be on the wire of the network that they're going to reside. And the second thing is we need to tell those devices who is going to manage them. So we have to give them the name or the IP address of the conductor so that what happens at that point, they will uh, alert the conductor of their presence. And at that point, the conductor will have to establish a trust relationship between it and the individual HIP services. So what this basically allows us to do is restrict on those HIP services on who can individually manage them. So once the conductor itself creates that relationship or that trust between those devices, those devices are only going to really answer to that individual conductor and nothing else within the environment. So like Eric said previously, HIP services could be a whole bunch of different things. They could be you know, industrial rated um, switches um, that are class one div two. They could be you know, native clients on individual devices like Windows or mobile devices or servers. They could also be embedded technologies as well. And we want to be able to give you a framework that allows us to go in and really populate these services, these identities, out to as far points within your environment as needed. So I'm going to let me jump into one of these and kind of show you what this looks like here. So there's a couple things that are very, very important. Yes, they will have an IP address on them, but one of the most important things is this. This is uh, that individual ID, that crypt this is a hash of that cryptographic ID that is determining the identity of this individual device. The IP address does not. It's this. This is what we are creating a trust-based relationship with by the orchestration engine to allow devices to communicate, to allow those HIP services to actually communicate between themselves. Also within this screen, you can see that we're setting up different levels of encryption and so forth, all based on whatever the customer's individual needs are, or based on what your security policies are within your individual enterprise. Now, one other thing I want to show you as well within this is the way that this was actually architected and created, it was really created, again, like Eric stated, within the OT realm. And OT guys are going to know what? They're going to know what individual device needs to communicate to what other device within the environment. So basically everything on a name basis. 
they're not going to know potentially the IP addresses. They're obviously not going to know the, the MAC addresses in most cases either. But they're going to know a specific PLC, for instance, needs to communicate to an HMI or a Storian or some type of control system out there. They might know that a safety system camera needs to communicate to a, a safety system manager or an alarm system communicating to a you know alarm control manager and so forth. They're going to know that. But they're not going to know access control lists. They're not going to know, you know, firewall rule sets or VLANs or those types of scenarios. So that's really how this was originally created. So what happens is, is that there's different ways to actually get this information into an individual HIP switch or into the configuration itself. We can actually import that information directly from some other type of methodology like an Excel spreadsheet or something else like this. We can also do discovery directly on here as well. And that, what that will do is a gratuitous ARP and listen to what's physically on that wire. Once that does that, that actually allows us to do a correlation between the IP addresses and the MAC addresses of those individual devices. So what happens is, is we have a feature called MAC Lockdown that allows us to tie those two or correlate those two together so that if we do see an issue on a device out there on the wire, we can make note of it. And based on some of those security concerns, we can actually restrict any further communication coming from that device and to explicitly allow that device to re-communicate together. So there could have been a reason why an individual device was changed from a hardware standpoint behind that IP address, you know, a PLC going bad or some other device going bad. But really what this is trying to protect is that when you have devices that are all across the globe and so forth. We don't want people to actually go in and take a device that they are in control of and hijack one of the IP addresses to potentially do something malicious within your environment. Now, the other thing I want you to note, want to note too, and it's a it's a huge problem that we're seeing today is with the converged plant and Ethernet. You know, originally when IP were actually uh, pushed out to these individual plant floors and so forth, they didn't worry about you know people having the same block of addresses on a per you know, across the board. They, they just, you know, set specific addresses out to a plant or a specific line within a plant or something like that, and they didn't care if it had the same block, you know, within a different part of the organization or a different location. So within our device, one of the things that's very important, we also have the ability to do NAT directly on this device. So by doing that, we can actually go in and create public-private segments just in case if you need to make a local or an, an internally initiated call directly through to one of those devices. So it allows us to have direct communication to those devices without changing the physical address on those individual devices. Because we all know by taking devices down that could potentially, you know, take our individual manufacturing floors down and so forth, and that's definitely not something that we want to do. Alrighty, so let's get to the uh, gist of how we're actually doing things today. So what happens is, is that after we get um, an information or of all those individual devices that are physically behind all those hip switches, we have the ability to create communications or overlays on who can actually communicate to what. So with this, with these overlays, it allows us to say, I want one device communicating to one within my environment. So it's really, we call it a three-click configuration within this. So within the overlay, I can name this whatever I want. So let's say, for instance, I'm going to over. I'm going to create one, and it's a use case that we're seeing a lot today. Let's say, for instance, I have a an SI that needs to get into us to, to a specific PLC within my environment. So I'll create this as SI access, and then help if I spell it right. And one other thing to note right on the screen, too, is we're directly integrated with LDAP and AD, so we can have different roles and responsibilities based on different user groups within those directory stores. So it's as easy then for me to say, yep, I have an SI, SI computer that's physically out there, or a laptop that we have oh, uh, an application running on, and he needs to get to, let's say, an individual PLC. Well, at that point, then, by clicking this trust-based radio button that is here, It'll allow us to create that communication between those two individual devices to allow those guys to communicate. Now, let me explain what's happened in the background here. So what has happened is the conductor has instructed these two HIP services 
to actually go on and make an exchange from a trust-based relationship between those two. Once it does that, all further communication between those two devices must use that HIP ID to allow the communication channel to be accepted on either end. Once that occurs, then the actual it will, the conductor will instruct these HIP services to establish an encrypted communication channel between those individual devices. So there is a key exchange that occurs after that trust-based relationship has established itself. So that is a completely different thing compared to traditional TCP IP encryption out there today. Once it does that, then it's actually going to create a whitelist to say, yeah, in this scenario we're going to allow um, this individual PLC to communicate and see this individual laptop over this individual overlay that I created between those two individual devices. So the other thing that's important with this overlay as well is that we have the ability to enable and disable this thing just by the click of a, of a button. So this is uh, not doing something gracefully. It's literally lopping it off like somebody taking you know, a pair of wire snips and cutting the wire at that point between these two individual devices. So this is important that if, if you have a remote access user that needs to get into a specific device and you want to restrict on when that user has the ability to get that, either we can do that through a RESTful API that we have or we can do it directly by clicking that individual button right here within the orchestration engine itself. So it makes it really easy to manage and again at the end of the day all I really needed to know is which device needs to communicate to which other device within my environment. Now one other thing I want to show you before I go on to some other demos here is that once we have all these individual HIP services that are here, these are all managed right through this orchestration engine. So for instance, by clicking on this, there's a whole bunch of different management functions that I can physically do right through this single or this conductor. And one of the things that we get asked quite a bit is that what happens if I've got one of these HIP switches and it's out there in the middle of a plant floor and we have nobody local from an administrator standpoint other than maybe a, a factory guy that's out there at that remote location. What happens if I lose that device or if I have to replace it? So for us it's very important and it's very simple for us to do. So you can instruct uh, an individual at that individual plant floor to take a new HIP switch, literally plug it in into the environment of where that other HIP switch was at and at that point we will see it within the orchestration engine. So it allows us to say you know what, at this point I need to replace a hip switch with another hip switch that I physically have. And I know this is as, has different labeling here, but it's as simple as us for clicking on the checkbox. And what we will do is we'll actually push the identity of the one that we want to replace to the one that we are replacing it with right by this one click. So we're not having to go and move, we're not having to go and physically move files back and forth or, or find a backup of that individual device and so forth. All that is done run right through this centralized orchestration engine through this single pane of glass that can be at you know a specific management site or a data center or wherever you would like to have it positioned. So getting back to this, another important thing to note is that when you have a bunch of devices like this with a whole bunch of that are out there, what we can do, <coughs> that's interesting, um, what we can do is we can actually create groups of like devices to allow you to put these guys together to make them much easier to manage. So let's say for instance, I want to go and I want to put all my cameras together in one communication group. I can create what's called a device group to allow these guys to be in one manageable object. So in this case, I'm going to create these, I'm going to create a group called, let's say, CCTV group. <clears throat> and then within that group, I can go in and I can search for, again, based because we're doing everything on name, I can search for the individual IP cameras that are physically out there. In this case, I've got 44 of them that are within my environment. And by clicking on this radio button, it allows me to select all those guys and produce a group that is just for those individual cameras. Once I do that, then I can use it as a device that I actually physically want to manage. So what we do is the same thing like I did previously with that SI access. I can create a group called CCTV and allow us to have one individual communication channel from different locations directly back to our primary data center using this single pane of glass. Again, I'm not having to go out and remotely manage you know, access control lists, firewalls, uh, VP, um, 
adding VPNs, all the rest of that stuff, all that is done right through this single pane of glass. So by doing this, then I can go in and click on, let's say, for instance, this CCTV manager, and then I'm going to select that group as well. And again, like I said previously, by selecting the trust-based relationship between on those radio buttons, it allows me to create that overlay between the group of CCTV or those cameras that are physically out there at those remote locations directly to that CCTV manager. In this case, it's, it's a, a few different locations that I've actually communicated together uh, to establish both the trust-based relationship between those devices and then allowing those whitelists light white lists to actually allow that communication to occur. So when you take a look at this then, now I've got multiple physically open, physical uh, communication channel or overlays based on those individual business needs that people have today. So with this orchestration engine and with the identity defined fabric that we have, it allows us to have you know, hundreds and, or thousands of overlays based on the individual communication channels of how you want things to communicate within your environment. It's not broken down by network, it's bit broken down by the individual device itself to make it very easy to manage from an OT standpoint. And again, at the end of the day, from a network configuration, from a security configuration and so forth, as you're seeing, we didn't touch any of those individual devices. Everything is literally done under the covers by the, um, by the intelligence that we have within our conductor to actually create all that certificate management, create all the exchanges themselves, create all the whitelisting and all the communication channels based on whatever the actual customer's needs are. And again, um, from one last thing as well, any type of management, updating, revoking, all that can be done directly through to here. So one another example that we actually are seeing, and I don't know if you guys saw a lot of this news that happened, but ransomware is now hitting the, uh, we've all heard about that, ransomware is now hitting the manufacturing site. So let's say, for instance, we have a factory that, that's had some type of malware or ransomware that's physically there, and I want to completely disable any further communication directly from that whole factory. By clicking on that, I've literally uh, restricted all that badness directly within that factory itself for us to go in and try and mitigate the, the actual vulnerability that's occurred so that that does not propagate itself across the enterprise that we have to other locations within our manufacturing environment itself. So it gives us lots of flexibility to it. And again, everything being managed by the single pane of glass, it allows us to be uh, very either very restrictive or very um, broad based on what we want to do. And then one last thing uh, before I turn it back over to Eric here and answer questions. Let's say, for instance, that I do have a, a laptop or a device that's been out there and that device has actually been stolen and it's part of this individual infrastructure. Well, with this as well, we can disable network communications, but another thing that we can do is physically revoke it. So once we do that and we apply it, that'll, that'll basically say at this point that device is nothing more than a brick. It will not have the ability to communicate to any of the overlays or any of the trust models that we've established with it at that point. It'll be very restrictive. And if we do find it again, that's great. We can actually go and unrevoke it right from here as well. Uh, but it, but it, basically what it gives us the ability to do is that until that occurs, uh, that point, uh, this device will pretty much be lost and we won't have to worry about somebody trying to get into the environment unless deemed necessary based on uh, if it's found or not within the actual environment. So that being said, let me go back to, to Eric here. And then we're going to actually, let me bring this back up. So I was moving things around, so it took a little, so I didn't want to cover everything that I was doing. And I'm not able to get it. Oh, there it goes. So I'm going to give this back to Eric as a presenter. And again, we're here to answer any questions that you physically have. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. That was great. Yeah. So, you know, a couple of things that you saw there uh, while Rob was giving a demo, just to, to reinforce the, uh, you know, what was possible. If you think about the alternatives, like he had said, that ability to instantly revoke, you know, for example, that, that laptop, it wouldn't matter if somebody who lost their laptop actually had um, their password and usernames you know, on a sticky note on that thing. Uh, they, the, the password and usernames might still be valid, but if they're trying to access on that same device, it's not getting in um, because it's not presenting 
you know, into the IDN fabric because it's not, it doesn't have a valid cryptographic identity anymore. So that type of control, if you tried to do that in the kind of traditional IT security and networking world, um, that would be pretty difficult to enforce. The certificate revocation list that you would have to uh, enable if you were using VPNs for this purpose, and the access control list because there's so many different entry points into the network. It, it was one-click mitigation. Um, I don't know of anything on the market that can do that. And, and, and that's, again, a derivative of an identity first model, just like these other, uh, other um, use cases. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill to, uh, to uh, moderate the question and answer session. Excellent. Thank you. And um, we've got a few time for a few questions. And I'll remind everybody that any questions we don't get to Later, you'll receive answers from uh, experts here. Um, let's start with this one. Is there only one conductor per network? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll take that one. And um, I guess if there is only one, what happens if the hip service, if that one go, conductor goes down? Right, right. Um, it, it's very flexible. So yes, uh, and it depends on the scale uh, of how many HIP services you have under management. We have some customers that have all of their, you know, identity defined network and policies managed in one conductor. Um, then what they do often is uh, have a, a, a standby. And it, that standby could either be one of our physical appliances or more commonly we have uh, customers that are running the standby conductor in AWS Cloud. So, um, and it's very simple to bring that one, if one goes down, bring the other uh, online. We also have, um, interestingly enough, it, it's uh, some retail customers, but it's on their, their fulfillment center side. And the way they organize it is they have regional uh, um, domain uh, experts and who have the responsibility based on a region and so fulfillment centers within that region and so they'll organize and have a conductor say per region that covers five to ten fulfillment centers um, to manage it that way and so that they've got more of a follow the sun or follow you know the the time change model uh, it's very flexible. We don't restrict uh, how far and wide or how many conductors you can run. There will be physical limitations um, on the conductor and how many devices it can scale up to, but we haven't hit that limit yet with our customers. Okay, very good. Um, you know, when you talk about having a standby, standby, what kind of latency time is there for a changeover? Oh, it's instant. It's just okay. it's just sitting there inert. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, here's a question that came in. Uh, what sort of signal lag does this technology introduce into the control alarm signaling communications? I guess I guess does it add overhead when I'm let's say I'm using an industrial network protocol that's going through this architecture? What kind of latency might it add? Yeah. To the communications. Rob, I'll, I'll let you uh, add to this, but I'll tell you this. One of the beautiful things about um, the host identity protocol design from the beginning, and keep in mind that the, the folks that were behind this standard that was just recently ratified in, in 2015, April of 2015 by the IETF, um, the, the genesis of this protocol were mobile carriers, like the Verizons and also the, the, the manufacturers like you know, Nokia and such, as well as the military for secure communications and folks like Boeing. So the efficiency of the four-way handshake, that, that first authentication and authorization step before TCP uh, channel is established in any data exchange, that is super efficient and adds very, very little latency. Once a tunnel, an encrypted tunnel, is set up between the endpoints, the overhead is very modest as well. 
However, you know, um, uh, and I, I'm talking about at you know the sub uh, microsecond, uh, you know, less than five microseconds. However, there might be real time communications, uh, and of course, distance matters as well between these things because it's just that's physics. Um, but as far as adding additional overhead to it, it it's very minor. And, and Rob, you've had some experience. Well, you have a lot of experience with you know some of the utility folks that have very remote sites and and systems and and how to connect those. So there, there's a couple really easy ways to answer this. So so we are using this in for video systems and and those types of scenarios. Plus, and here's one that will really resonate as well. We've actually done quite a bit of testing with safety systems uh, that have been developed with Rockwell and, and others that are out there. And we have no problem being part of the communication channel for safety systems out there between a centralized monitoring or data center and the remote facilities where those safety systems actually reside. So like Eric said previously, we're talking you know, microseconds in regards to latency. But you have to remember what we're doing as well. So we are establishing a communication that is military grade from an encrypted standpoint between our individual devices and isolating that communication as it's traversing across that commodity network. So by doing that, there's going to be a little bit of a cost to it. But like we said, we're talking you know microseconds in regards to that cost. Yeah, that's very good. I guess maybe I would characterize it and this might not be a perfectly accurate, but for me it might not, it helps me, I guess. It's almost like creating a secure socket connection, if anybody's familiar with old sockets. Yeah. And once you establish that, now you, now you have your encrypted messages going across. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually a lot like an IPsec connection, be as it's creating what's called an ESP tunnel uh, between those two individual devices. So it's a little bit different than SSL, but, but yeah, absolutely, it's the same methodology. Okay, cool. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, on, the o on the overlay network, can you allow or block specific ports? And for example, allowing SSH on port 22 for remote access, for instance, and disabling every other port. Yeah, so there is um, there is a packet filtering firewall that we actually uh, have embedded within the solution itself. So it allows us to restrict based on source and destination uh, IP addresses and ports as well as the individual protocol as well. So we're not going to do deep packet validation of protocol, but we are going to restrict based on the service port itself and the source de and destination of the individual uh, IP addresses. Okay, excellent. Um, here's another interesting one, and I think I know kind of where it's coming from. For a trust relationship, is there a way to control the direction of data flow between communicating devices? And yeah. I'm guessing the questioner might have been thinking of like data diodes. I, uh, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can think of this, that's one of the powerful functions. I'm glad they brought this up. Think of it as a virtual data diode. Um, you can have uh, unidirectional communication established. So, yeah, you got that PLC and you only want it to be able to communicate out and nothing to be able to communicate in. Yep, that's a simple policy ad. Okay, good. Um, here's another one that may not be the easiest, but it's wondering what kind of cost, and not just the pure cost of additional hardware, implementation time, you know, integration time, to implement this? Um, Rob can speak to that, but I, I do have one comment. Uh, one of the beauties here is when we go to, and a customer asks us to do a proof of, we don't do proof of concepts because we know this works, so we just go in to demonstrate value. Um, if we know the environment, you know, know the IP addressing schemes, uh, they give us access, we usually are able to set up uh, a good uh, proof of value pilot um, in under a couple of hours. It's, it's very non-disruptive. And again, that goes back to the host identity protocol itself. It, it was meant to be backward and forward compatible and be able to be a true overlay. This is one of the differences between SDN and IDN, identity-defined networking versus software-defined networking. Software-defined networking 
has to interface with the underlay. We don't have to configure the underlay. Rob, do you have anything to add? Yeah. So the other thing to kind of show you that as well, from a costing standpoint, we have, you know, traditional perpetual mo um, costing models that are out there where you're buying an individual device, including a license, and then having a reoccurring support contract. But we also have um, a subscription model as well, which OT guys are much more in tune to, you know, where you're buying a subscription based on a yearly basis for the service that's physically out there. What we're finding in regards to a, a cost scenario, especially now that we have the ability to go down and, and have specific modules or, or agents or what we call clients as our hip services running directly on devices or giving us the ability to actually go and, and I have to admit where we're seeing a lot of people deploy this is in front of specific, specific pods or manufacturing lines. So there's not a huge cost to it. You know, retail on a lot of our, our hip switches for what most people are doing is, you know, if you're buying the perpetual model, it's like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 less. But when you get down to a software model, it's much more um, easy for from a barrier of entry standpoint from that cost analysis. But what we're finding is, is that you know, when you take a look at the operational cost of what it actually allows, what it, you have to do today to what we're physically doing or daily management to what you're doing today, uh, we're seeing a dramatic reduction in operational costs for these types of environments. I know that when Eric Eric presented a slide up there of, of, of a dramatic cost reduction, you know, realistically in the field, what we're seeing on a manufacturing side is 60 per, or 70 percent reduction in total cost of the actual environment. And if you were going to try and do this with traditional means, let's say. First and foremost, you'd still be based on everything on an IP address, so there wouldn't be really any trust relationship established. But just think about it. You'd have to actually have some type of firewall capability added to it, and then from there you'd have to have a policy established. There would be certificate management between the devices or within the infrastructure itself. And then you'd have to have some type of either creating a centralized orchestration engine with it or looking at something that's physically out there that you might be able to, to customize for you to do this. So needless to say, when you take a look at the cost of the model compared to where we are today and what would actually take you to do, there's no way that you could actually create that overlay model uh, within three clicks and have that disparate across, you know, potentially hundreds of different locations as quick as we can physically do within our solution. Excellent. Well, with that, I think we're going to need to stop. I'll remind everybody they'll get answers to questions that weren't asked or that we didn't panel in the webinar, and ask everybody to have a great day. Thank you so much, Eric and Rob. Thank Perfect. you. Thanks. Bye-bye.